Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review on The Turn of the Key by Ruth Ware. So Ruth Ware is a thriller author. I've read a few of her books by now. I will say, just a little spoiler alert in terms of how the review is going to go, this has been the favourite uh, of mine of the ones that I've read of hers so far. That was a clunky sentence. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... When Rowan comes across the advert, it seems too good to be true. A live-in nanny position with an extremely generous salary. What she doesn't know is that she's stepping into a nightmare. One that will end with a child dead and her in a cell awaiting trial for murder. She knows she's made mistakes, but she's not guilty. At least not of murder. Which means someone else is. So, let's go in and check out some tabs. Going straight into the book. It's written kind of almost in an episodic format. So we get a bunch of uh, letters from, what's her name, uh, Rowan, to a lawyer protesting her innocence, basically. Um, so we know she's in jail, and then we kind of skip back and she tells the story from the beginning. It actually works quite well here. I've seen it done badly before, but here it did work okay. I think it's because Ware didn't interrupt the storytelling too often to remind us that, that we were reading her letters, if that makes sense. And so they're offering £55,000 per year, gross including bonus, use of a car, and eight weeks holiday a year, which is insane numbers. And she did, you know, pick up on that. It says, that should have been my first warning signal, you know, the salary, because it was stupidly generous. I mean, it would have been generous even for London, even for a live out nanny, but for a nanny in someone's house with free accommodation provided and all bills paid, even down to the car, it was ridiculous. It was so ridiculous, in fact, that I half wondered if there'd been a typo. And uh, she gets a response when she applies from it from Sandra Ellencourt, uh, the mother, basically saying that Heatherbray, the house, is haunted, and that's why they've been finding it difficult to keep nannies over the recent years. So here we get a bit of a uh, bit of description about the place, and it almost made me think of like Manderley, at least in terms of the way it's described, um, like the language that's used rather than maybe the description. At last we came out of the shelter of the trees and into a clearing, and I saw Heatherbray House for the first time. I've been expecting something ostentatious, a McMansion maybe, or a sprawling log-built ranch, but that wasn't what greeted me at all. The house in front of me was a modest Victorian lodge, four square, like a child's drawing of a house, with a glossy black door in the centre and windows on each side. It was not big, but solidly built of granite blocks, with lush Virginia creeper rambling up one side of it, and I could not have put my finger on exactly why, but it exuded warmth and luxury and comfort. Dusk had fallen, and as Jack turned off the engine of the Tesla and extinguished the headlights, the only illumination from all around was the stars, and the lamps from inside the house itself shining out across the gravel. It looked like something from a sentimental illustration, those nostalgia-soaked twinkly photographs on the front of the jigsaws that my grandmother had loved. Soft grey stone, lichened and weathered, golden lamps shining out through the clean rippled glass of the windows, overblown roses scattering their petals in the dusk. It was almost too perfect unbearably perfect in some strange way and we learn that uh rihanna the older daughter she has fuck off keep out or you die written across the panelled wood uh, in what looked like smeared red lipstick of her bedroom door and then she accidentally flashes the handyman which i'm not sure whether that makes a good first impression or not you know and here's the description of the father uh uh, he was so, so comfortable. He was padded every inch of him. I don't mean he was fat, but he was cushioned physically, emotionally, financially, in a way that he just didn't seem to grasp. And it was his very ignorance of the fact that made it even more infuriating. And we learn that the dad's a bit of a creep. And she says, suddenly the supernatural stuff didn't seem so mysterious after all. Not a poltergeist. Just your average 50-something man who couldn't keep his dick in his pants. The same old boring, depressing story. And we get the line, no rest for the wicked, which made me smile because that's the, the name of my first novel. Well, novella. And um, Rhiannon gets back and we get this. Um, As she passed, though, I caught a whiff of something else, low and massed by the scent of bacon, but so odd and out of place and yet so familiar that it stopped me in my tracks. It was a sweet, slightly rotten smell that jerked me sharply back to my own teenage years, though it still took me a minute to pin down. When the association finally clicked into place, though, I was certain. It was the cherry-ripe reek of cheap alcohol leaching out of someone's skin the morning after it's been drunk. And there is a big reveal towards the end uh, that Rowan Kane is not everything that she appears to be at first glance. And she asks the handyman um, why he didn't warn her the, about Bill. And he goes, bit hard to say, oh, I by the by, my boss is a wee bit of a perv. Difficult to bring up on a first day. And then uh, we learn the real reason why she would never sleep with Bill Ellencourt, um, which I'm not going to share because it's a big spoiler, but I did like that reveal. And she's trying to figure out how did the murder happen and who was the murderer. 
and uh, she discovers that Jack was married, the handyman who she'd been having kind of an affair with, which I thought that was an underwhelming reveal. I thought that was pretty obvious, to be honest. Um, and at the very end, because I was getting to this and I was like, there's only like five pages left and it hasn't revealed who, who did it. Um, and we get a letter at the end that explains exactly what happened and who was behind it. And I did like that. I think, it, again, I don't really read these kinds of things trying to predict who the killer is. So I didn't predict who the killer was. I think it would be pretty easy if you wanted to. But uh, again, I just read it more for the journey, and I can't really fault it for that. Overall, as you can probably tell, I did enjoy The Turn of the Key. I gave it a strong 4 out of 5. I think it's definitely Ruth Ware's best yet. Um, her others have all been just okay. This one is actually quite good. So I would recommend it. Um, even if you've read Ruth Ware before, and you haven't particularly got on with her, but you want to give her another chance, this one is probably the one to go for. And it's not a bad introduction to her work as well. You know, it can, they can all be read as standalones anyway. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Turn of the Key by Ruth Ware. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.